Last week on Educational Forum, leading experts and former athletes discussed the current concussion crisis happening in professional sports. This week, we examine the role that equipment plays, the effects of concussions in youth, and the steps we can take to reduce the prevalence of concussions and second impact syndrome. I'm Holly Vietzke, and this is the Massachusetts School of Law Educational Forum. One of the issues that frequently arises when discussing the increase in diagnosed concussions is the safety of the equipment. Players are unquestionably bigger, stronger, and faster now. Chris Nowinski, a former professional wrestler and collegiate football player, notes in his book Head Games that since 1920, the average force generated by an offensive lineman has more than doubled. Has the equipment kept pace? Or have the advances in equipment given players a false sense that they are safer? With all the improved equipment, it creates more impact. And, you know, there's a debate going back and forth between you know, whether, you know, the better equipment and, and, you know, greater impacts can, can have the same effect or whether, you know, less equipment, less, you know, uh, equipment can create a situation where the players are actually, you know, uh, technically hitting the right way and not, you know, leading with their head and not creating the, the you know, high impact car crash type uh, uh, hits that are, that you see every week. You know, I, I think they're doing a lot right now. I think, uh, you know, there's definitely a, an increased focus on, uh, on player safety right now, um, you know, with the penalties that are, that are being uh, instituted and with the, the focus on, um, you know, reducing the, the high impact uh, hits, the helmet to helmet hits, the, the head hits. But, uh, you, you know, I think, uh, you know, some rules changes could could possibly do that but you know until the rule changes are instituted and you see what the effect is you know sometimes you know some rules you know have adverse effects so you know you have to you have to try different things and see what's what's working you know and I think you know a lot of it starts from you know the youth and and, and high school level too and just teaching the right techniques uh, of hitting and playing the game to uh, you know, to, to not always lead with the head and, and go for the helmet to helmet hits. Equipment plays a role. One of the hats I wear is as a vice president of NOXI, which certifies football helmets and other athletic equipment. And there's no doubt that helmets are better today than they were 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, they were better than 20 years ago. But helmets don't prevent the majority of concussions and probably never will because they do a quite a good job with regard to those focal linear forces like a stick over your head and they do a quite poor job of attenuating the forces of rotatory impacts like snapping your head from a blow to the side of the head. This is a normal nerve cell. You have the dendrites, you have the nerve cell and you have the axon um, and the signal arrives at the nerve cell, it's transmitted to it it's transmitted along the axon and then with neurotransmitters they are released that then propagates the message on to the next neuron in the chain. When you have a concussive injury you have this metabolic chaotic event where the potassium that normally is inside the cell goes outside the cell. So it goes from the inside to the outside extracellular space when these ions rush out of the cell, it allows the positively charged calcium ions to replace them inside the cell. But these calcium ions shut down the ATP, which is the energy pump that's needed to pump them out and pump the potassium back in. Um, so it leads to this metabolic dysfunction and it's at this stage that the cell is alive, but the cell is not functional, functioning. And if you stress it, either physically or cognitively, you can tip the balance and cause this cell to die. And that's why the hallmark of concussion management is physical and cognitive rest until symptoms have cleared, or at least gotten a great deal better. And then in, with most concussions, after a period of time, uh, the potassium ions will get pumped back inside, the calcium ions will get pumped out, the neurotransmitters will be put back on. So after a period of time, you have a normal functioning 
situation and there's no demonstrable injury that can be demonstrated. And so no matter how much they're improved, they're, they're not going to dramatically decrease the most injurious of all accelerated forces, the, the rotational ones. So I think it's great to keep working to build a better helmet, and I, I don't think any of that work should ever slow down. And I think it's great uh, educating that new helmets are better than old helmets, and let's um, uh, definitely recondition helmets frequently and, and uh, eliminate uh, helmets that have been in the market for 10 years, period. Um, but I don't think helmets are the solution. They're great for eliminating skull fracture. Uh, they're great for reducing the incidence of acute intracranial bleeds, the subdurals, but they haven't done much for concussions. It depends on how you use the equipment to the, determine how much it helps against concussion. Uh, I would say for decades we made better helmets, meaning they fit better and uh, they felt better. And therefore, the problem was, even if they did protect better against force, athletes started using them as a weapon and as the point of contact. And so if you go back and watch, go on YouTube and watch old football clips from the 50s and 60s and everyone tackled with their shoulder, especially when they added the helmet and then the face mask and then got really good fit and went from suspension helmets to air pockets and all of that, athletes suddenly found out that the best way to knock somebody down is to hit them with your forehead. And then we started doing that and not penalizing it. And so therefore, if you played prior to the last couple of years when we did start penalizing it, you were pro even though you had the best helmets, you are probably also receiving the most brain trauma because people were able to use their helmet and hit you in a way they never would before. Now that we realize this is a problem, we are penalizing intentional hits to the head, which is the most important thing we can do. And then helmet manufacturers are getting smarter about focusing more on these more, you know, not only concussions but milder hits. And so independent studies have shown the last generation of helmets are dramatically better than prior generations. But there's a limit to how great they can be because you're still stopping moving bodies and you still have brains floating in fluid slamming into skulls and twisting around. And no helmet will ever be able to fully eliminate concussions. But they are a piece of the puzzle. But people have for too long put way too much faith in them. Uh, and then if you look beyond helmets, you know, all the equipment has really made the games more dangerous. And hockey is finally having a legitimate discussion about that because they started, you know, you basically, the thing that kept us all from colliding into each other for, since the dawn of humanity has been the pain that came with it. And now that we've invented these really cool shoulder pads and elbow pads and all these other things, we don't feel that pain. And so you combine a helmet with gigantic, and, and you know titanium shoulder pads and all that whatever they're putting in there combined with really hard elbow pads where they especially the latest generation of things in hockey uh, people it's more dangerous because you can hit each other harder and so people are actually moving away especially in hockey from hard elbow pads bigger shoulder pads we're starting to get some sense back into the fact that your your body is there to uh, the pain is there to tell you when things are wrong and if we cover that up we're making mistakes doesn't the technology exist to make a safer helmet? I certainly hope not. <laughs> I certainly hope they're not holding that back uh, from the public. I mean, I think growth has been made in, in every generation as they go. A lot of that growth that's come in protection has actually simply been making the helmets bigger. Um, but also the materials inside are getting better. And so, the, the, I mean, and you know, technology is, is ramping up very quickly. And so I would, I, I would be surprised if there's technology sitting out there that no one's applying that's going to solve this problem tomorrow, but it's, I think we can expect it to get better every year. Do mouth guards help at all? Mouth guards help the oral uh, dentition for sure. Uh, they protect your teeth. Uh, I'm a strong advocate, therefore, of wearing them in collision sports, but they do precious little in reducing concussion. There are really only two um, theoretical blows that they may help in, and that is a blow underneath your chin that's directly up. So if you're wearing a cushion between your upper and lower jaws, you're going to reduce the forces. Also a blow right to the very point of the chin that drives the occipital condyles of your jaw back into the base of the skull uh, mouth guards can attenuate those forces. 
but the great majority of blows to the head in collision sports are to the side, to the top, to the back, to the face mask if you're wearing one. They're not to the point of the chin or under the chin. In fact, in football with your face mask, you really can't get to the point of the chin. So um, I don't think that um, mouth guards should be viewed as protecting against concussion in any significant way. Helmets have the most potential for technological advances that could reduce the severity of impact. So an obvious question becomes, why don't manufacturers develop a helmet that would better protect the head? In Head Games, Nowinski addresses this very issue. One problem, as he explained, is that 35 years ago, there were 14 helmet manufacturers. Today, there are no more than six. What happened was that in 1975, a 19-year-old football player injured in a game became a quadriplegic and sued the helmet manufacturer resulting in a $3 million out-of-court settlement. This started a trend, and the cost of settlements eventually outweighed the gross income of the entire helmet industry, forcing most of the manufacturers to go bankrupt or cease operations. Another problem is that one of the leading helmet makers pays for the right to be the official league helmet. So any improvements made by other manufacturers will have a very difficult time making inroads into the NFL. One such manufacturer, located in Lowell, Massachusetts, has designed a helmet that uses 18 airbag-like shock absorbers that reduces the risk of concussions by as much as 60%. Players using this helmet, manufactured by Zenith, have reported a 70% decrease in headaches. But as of a year ago, the most recent data available, only 1-2% to of NFL players were wearing a Zenith helmet. And although players are allowed to wear whichever helmet they choose, if they wear anything other than the NFL-endorsed helmet, they must cover up the logo so it is not visible. Requests for an interview with Zenith went unanswered. News of professional athletes sustaining concussions surfaces, it seems, at least weekly during NFL and NHL playing seasons. In fact, during the most recent NFL season, there were at least three players on the injury report for a concussion in any given week, with several weeks listing as many as 13 players. These are adults choosing to play sports for a living. As serious as the problem already is, it becomes much more significant when children are experiencing head trauma. According to a recent Boston Globe article, approximately 136,000 concussions occur each year in high school. Said the concussions, we've had, I believe, four. Uh, and they're, you know, very uh, strict about what you can do and what you can't do when you have the concussion. So basically, uh, it's, you know, follow the, the rules of the MIAA, follow what the doctors are telling. Uh, us about the kids, um, you know, and just hopefully try and get them back to health so that they can come back. But I mean, obviously, the most important thing is is the students' health, uh, and you know, they have a life after high school. You know, this is not the end of the world. In boys hockey and men's hockey, these players are faster and stronger than ever before. And in the girls' hockey, it's no different. They're faster and stronger at a different level, and you know, the, the impact is is much more severe. So. Um, they are working with equipment, you know, they're working with taking the hardness out of shoulder pads and the hardness out of elbow pads, and, uh, but there's still, there's still always going to be that element because that's a fast game. You're out there flying, you know, and when, you, and when an incident happens, it happens at high speed. Is a child who suffers a concussion more at risk for second impact syndrome or can that child recover completely given the amount of time between concussions? concussions? I think that's a great question. Uh, I believe that a child that's completely recovered from a concussion and has had a adequate period of time for their brain to heal is not at risk for second impact syndrome. The people that are at risk for second impact syndrome are people where the brain hasn't healed and it's still symptomatic. At any age? At any age and there's no magic one day, one week, two weeks, three weeks that as long as the brain is still symptomatic and you're still healing, it could be a month or two months later or after the initial insult, although most of them happen within a matter of a week or two. Obviously getting a concussion is never ideal, but is there any age that it's the worst to have a concussion? Well, I don't think there's a numerical age, but I think there is a grouping of ages where it's uh, probably more injurious, and we're much more worried about our youth with developing brains than we are with adults. Um, Adults have fully myelinated brains. Their heads are not disproportionately large compared with the rest of the body. And our necks, hopefully, if we're an athlete in a collision sport, are well-developed. 
Um, that's not true of our youth. Our youth have brains that are much uh, more easily injured because the myelin, which is the coating of nerve fibers, um, kind of like the insulation on telephone wires, it, it isn't fully formed. Uh, so it's easier to disrupt nerve tissue in a youth. Youth have very large heads relative to the rest of their body, uh, and neck muscles are characteristically pretty weak as well. All that sets up uh, a given force that may not be that much having a greater impact on the brains of our youth. So we're very much concerned about our youth as a group. Uh, it takes less in the way of a force to produce a concussion, and as a group, not an individual in every case, but as a group, they recover more slowly than do adults. So, Should I not let my children play hockey then? Well, I have very strong feelings um, based on 30 plus years of seeing many, many concussion patients. My average week for me is now 25 to 30 concussion patients. Um, plus the work that we've done uh, at the Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy at BU and the great work that Ann McKee is involved with. Thinking of teenagers already with incipient CTE, thinking of individuals from Pop Warner football that lost entire school years because they couldn't remember their classmates' names for many months at a time, um, lost just about all the language they'd learned in, in math. Um, reflecting on all of that, I personally think that collision sports should not be participated in by individuals under the age of 14 as they're currently being played. The head trauma's got to come out of them. The, the sports can be modified to be made much safer with regard to head trauma. I don't think we have to give up playing the sports, but I think we have to give up playing them as we're currently playing them. What is second impact syndrome? Second impact syndrome is an individual that's still symptomatic from an initial brain injury. And because the most common athletic brain injury is concussion, most of the injuries were concussions, but not all of them. Some were subdural hematomas that were missed. Some were brain contusions or bruising of the brain. So the brain is injured. You have post-concussion symptoms. You have brain injury symptoms. And then the individual is subjected to another brain trauma, sometimes very minor, and the brain loses its ability to control blood flow. It's a loss of autoregulation. Blood flow rushes in the brain, pools because it can't get out fast enough. What you see is this dark area here uh, within the ventricle, which is largely filled with blood, and increases intracranial pressure and sets up a scenario that's very unique to this condition where somebody is subjected to brain trauma sometimes not all that dramatic, uh, may get up a little stunned, but within minutes, two, three, four, five, goes from this alert conscious state to being comatose, fixed dilated pupils, respiratory embarrassment due to brain herniation, and it's a life-threatening condition. John Lilly, a scout for the Toronto Maple Leafs, admitted that a history of concussions does factor into his evaluations when he is scouting players. I mean, it's something that we do, um, we do look at. You know, it's it's a very serious uh, issue right now in the game, and and if a, if a young man has has had a lot of concussions, it's certainly something that we look at. Um, it definitely is something that uh, you know it's a concern. It just seems like again there, there's more and more um, coming to light. So from the player's perspective, it's there's a real advantage to denying that you've had a concussion or to trying to get on the ice because you don't want that stigma attached to you if you want to turn pro. Yeah, but in, in the same breath again, um, you know, it's, you're talking about your, your head and your brain and it's not something you can, you can take lightly. So I think that I like the way it is now because it's okay to, to, to say you're, you're hurt. And, you know, it's like I was talking to somebody the other day, if you hurt your knee, the doctor can look at your knee and see it's swollen and, and, and decide, you know, you, you have a tear or whatever, your brain is very hard to, to diagnose in a split second as to, to what's wrong. So I, I think it's, it's a good thing that the, the kids are, are you know, are, are saying they have concussions now so that, you know, they don't play and, uh, you know, do further damage. 
Beth Adams is a rehabilitation specialist treating children with head injuries, many of them with second impact syndrome. Unfortunately, her practice is very busy. And what are some of the more disturbing cases you've seen? Very disturbing case that I saw was a boy who was 15 years old playing football at the time of injury and he was unable to recognize friends and family to participate in school for an entire year. So we had a case of amnesia where friends would have to walk him around school and reacquaint him to others. He didn't know his family had to be reacquainted by pictures and it was a horrific event for the family to have to go through this at such a young age. And what's the rehabilitation process like? The rehabilitation process varies depending on the individual and the blow to the head. Um, oftentimes it can be a couple of weeks and it can be up to a couple of years. Um, it's very slow at times, can be frustrating. Um, memory and every individual brain varies and so people get very frustrated that it's not happening quick enough. How often do they come in for treatment? They come in about once a week um, for something called cognitive rehabilitation where we work on strategies that sort of fill in the void of some of the parts of the brain that were injured. So we help adapt some of the um, extensions of their memory in order to keep them in check on a weekly basis so that they can remember what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. How pervasive and or serious do you think this problem is? I think it's very serious. I think we are taking it more seriously now. I think that over the years, and, and as you I'm sure can recall many years ago, there were those that just shrugged it off. You hear a lot of people continue to say shrug it off, but I think with more publicity and people coming forward that we are taking more precautions on looking at this seriously. How do concussions affect those children with pre-existing disorders and disabilities? Somebody with um, an example of a child with attention deficit disorder, oftentimes I'll hear a child or his parent come in and say, my ADHD is worse than ever and what do, what's going on with me is my ADHD getting worse and what I'm helping them understand is that the brain is so diffuse that wherever the injury is oftentimes it mimics ADHD and so people who feel racy or feel distracted or poor judgment um, or very hyper can be exacerbated up to ten times worse and so um, what I'm trying to do is help them understand that it's an exacerbation of their already symptoms. Are children who suffer multiple concussions over a shorter period of time more at risk than adults who might suffer more than one concussion? What I see now with the kids is that it's really affecting schooling and so I'm questioning myself as a clinician that multiple concussions really are um, having an impact on the kids and their learning. Now with adults with multiple concussions we do see that they have problems with work um, for the athletes, the professionals that try to get back in, they are feeling um, very foggy and they're not quite sure what's going on but I believe that the children I'm seeing I, I'm in question that there's a lot going on more so than the adults right now. Could it be worse because their brain is still developing? Children's brains are always developing um, and for me um, I, I, we know that children will continue on in the future with college hoping to graduate high school and for me the biggest concern that I have is with the multiple concussions and with the impact of learning that we really take a closer look at what these children are losing as they're going forward with these concussions. Now Dr. Robert Cantu believes strongly that children under 14 should not play any kind of contact sports. How, do you agree? Dr. Robert Cantu is absolutely correct. Um, Again, these children have a lot to lose. When you're an adult, you're pr playing professional. These are choices that you make. It now becomes your business, your job. Um, these children are being, I believe, ill-prepared when they're very young to know how to pull themselves out of the game. The coaches are trying to foster the sort of sports um, persona, you know, determination, spunk. And what these kids are too young to understand is the importance of the brain, you know, the I can't happen to me syndrome is really prevalent among all ages, but for the children, they're just not mature enough to know that they've got to pull out and they're just going to keep going. And um, I see these kids' um, future really in jeopardy. And I think that under 14 would be very safe to say absolutely no contact sports. Did you let your kids play? I have um, been very fortunate that I have a son that was too big to play Pop Warner and now is a high schooler. He's in ninth grade, still not playing, but because the law, the rules were written that didn't allow him, it took the onus off of me. But would I, I have? Absolutely not. 
My sons, when Tom passed away at eight and 10, were playing Pop Warner football. And um, I went home that year after meeting the four co-directors. Um, and I approached the league about, you know, um, getting some training for their coaches and they weren't interested. I let the kids, you know, the kids had just lost their dad. And when you're dealing with that, you're walking really on eggshells. You know, what do I do to keep some stability, to keep, you know, to keep um, things as uh, normal as I can for them so that they're not dealing with two. They really were looking forward to playing that summer. And at that time, I had, I didn't know nearly as much about the disease as I know now. Um, I don't let them play anymore because, um, one, because where I am in my area, they're still very, very behind the times in terms of awareness about this. They think they're aware, but they're not educated. And so I think they think they're doing a very adequate job now of, of doing a better job of, of diagnosing concussions and, and whatnot. Um, I don't believe that to be the case. And two, because the level of disease in my husband's brain was so significant at 45 that I, um, I have to believe my kids are probably more at risk and I'm just not willing to take a chance. Other athletes, however, are not so quick to take that opportunity away from their children. I have three girls um, and right now they're at a young age and, and hockey's a skill game at the level they're at. There's no checking. Obviously there's instances where they could you know, fall on the boards and things like that, but it, it doesn't concern me. Um, I think you know, as they get older, it might become a little more of a concern. We have to be more cautious now with the knowledge that's starting to come out um, with concussions and, and, and the side effects and, um, and things like that. So yeah, I would, but it wouldn't discourage uh, me from having them play hockey at, at all. It's going to be up to them. Uh, I'm here at the Sports Legacy Institute event because uh, I want to see changes made permanently. Um, so that when my son, who's two years old, decides to follow in dad's footsteps one day, um, that he doesn't have to be subjected to the mentality that I was subjected to uh, and everybody else before me um, that you know, caused uh, us to uh, have all these problems now. You know, uh, if, if we would have only uh, had the knowledge and uh, been told the consequences and the severity of uh, having a, these concussions and not addressing them seriously uh, and I wouldn't be sitting here today and a lot of these people wouldn't be sitting here today and the Sports Legacy Institute probably wouldn't have to be here today which is unfortunate you know because the information's been there it just hadn't been given to us. I would discourage them uh, more because it's a very tough business with a very uh, a minimal chance of being a success. It's all, it can be the greatest business in the world, but it's very tough. The chance of getting hurt are very good. The chance of being successful are very slim. Uh, I would insist that they have an, a, a college education and that they be realistic, which is what I, t I tell everybody. There's nothing wrong with pursuing your dreams, whether it be a, being an NFL player, an actor in, in Hollywood, or a, a wrestler in WWE, as long as you're realistic and have a backup plan. Fortunately for the student athletes, school athletic associations are taking this issue very seriously. In Massachusetts, the legislature recently passed a law designed to prevent the, the progression of concussions. The law, which has several requirements, involves everyone involved in school sports, from parents and volunteers to the school nurse. One thing that the schools have done differently, I used to receive a call on a Monday from a parent saying, oh my God, my son or daughter has had a concussion, what do we do? I still receive those calls, but now what the schools are doing because of the concussion law since summer of 2010 um, in the state of Massachusetts is that when the child has a concussion, they cannot return back until being cleared by a physician. The school nurse is also privy to it, as is the trainer. But everybody come Monday morning is more privy to the fact that the child has sustained a concussion. So now oftentimes I'll receive a call from the nurse saying, are there any accommodations that the child needs because we are familiar with the fact that he has had a concussion. One thing that I just want to caution is with a concussion law, children are supposed to be seeing their pediatrician. Um, and the families are taking the children to the pediatrician. But where I'm finding a little bit of a breakdown is that although as comprehensive as the pediatrician is um, and wants to be for the child, there are some pediatricians that are out there that are clearing the child to return. 
And I've had children return as early as three days because they're not displaying symptoms of concussion. Gone are the days where the symptom of concussion has to be vomiting or has to be dizziness. They can be subtle, but if the pediatrician isn't aware of it, the child is cleared to return and they go back to the playing field a week later. And this is incredibly dangerous. So what I'd like to see happen is that we have more resources for those that are able to clear the child with the knowledge of brain injury. Could it also be sometimes that the ch child is not being as forthright as he or she could be? Absolutely. And those children, if they want to play on that following game and they're the starter, they're not going to share a lot of information. But there are subtle neurocognitive assessments that can be done for the children to see if they're having any um, distraction, attention issues, um, other issues of cognition that might be problematic that a physician may not be able to pick up as subtle as they are because of their lack of um, education with concussions per se. The entity in charge of implementing and enforcing the new law is the Department of Public Health. Although it is quite a large undertaking, the department is efficiently making it as easy as possible for everyone involved. Dr. Lauren Smith is the medical director of the DPH and the person ultimately responsible for ensuring compliance with the law. Well, the department has a responsibility for turning the law into regulations and then supporting schools as they implement them. And when did you first start taking notice of head injuries and concussions in school sports? The department has been interested in this uh, for a while. Our data has shown us that, unfortunately, uh, head injuries in sports isn't rare. Uh, so several years ago, the department got a group together to really focus on concussions in sports. And over the past years, actually has um, distributed thousands of heads-up concussion kits that we get through the CDC, We've worked with key stakeholders like the Brain Injury uh, Association. So we've really been thinking about this for a while, even before the law was passed. And what have you been doing to implement the law? Have you been visiting schools? Implementing it is a, is a lot of uh, different steps. Uh, the first thing we needed to do was to uh, identify training that was mandated as part of the law. And this is training for parents and students as well as school athletic staff and others. And the rationale for that really is to make sure that everyone is on the same page, understands what the consequences of concussion can be, uh, especially if you don't uh, acknowledge it and recognize it early but also really just to understand what are the signs and symptoms. Or concussion can be subtle, and so a lot of people weren't aware that some of the things uh, really could be signs of concussion. What's involved in the training and who takes place? Is it a class? Is it a, a long course? The training we decided we really wanted to make sure it was easy and accessible to people, and we ideally wanted it to be free. So there are two trainings that we identified that had all of the key components of what we wanted people to know. Uh, one of those is through the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control has a website devoted to concussion uh, issues um, and so there's training for parents, students, coaches and others as well as a host of other materials which are great. The other is also excellent and that's the National Federation of High School Sports. They have an online training, again it's free uh, and hits all the high, par high points of what we would want people to know. So these coaches and trainers and parents, do they, they go in and they take almost like an online course, and then who certifies that they've taken it? There's two ways of doing that. One would be, uh, for example, uh, you can get a certificate that prints out, you know, with the, after you've completed the course. Um, the other thing that we wanted to make sure that people uh, had the opportunity to do, because not everyone has access to computers, is there's uh, materials for parents and students and coaches uh, on the website, the CDC website, and so people could print that off, hand it out, distribute it, uh, we've had uh, coaches and athletic directors hand them out at the preseason uh, meeting for the football team players and the parents, and then they just know who came to the meeting and take that attendance and know that everyone got the material. This seems relatively low cost to implement, or is there are there other expenses involved? The training piece should be low cost. Uh, I think really uh, most of it is we've tried very hard to incorporate the regulations that we've put in place into what we hope people are already doing. Uh, because we know that people, that the schools don't have uh, a lot of extra funds or any extra funds uh, to implement this. So we tried to be sensitive to that. How many student athletes in Massachusetts suffer diagnosed concussions each year? 
that's a good question. Uh, we don't have good data on the diagnosis of concussion. What we do have is data from a survey of students which showed us that about 18% said that they had had an injury to the head during sports that caused a number of symptoms that could be con con consistent with concussion. Now, whether or not they were diagnosed with it, we don't know, but that was 18%, which is a lot of kids. Despite the good intentions behind the law, it has its critics. A recent Boston Globe article reported that some school officials complained that the law burdens districts by requiring more documentation and paperwork. Initially, there was some uh, apprehension, as I think uh, anytime schools are asked to do something new or in addition to their already pretty full agenda that they're responsible for, there could be a little bit of anxiety about that. Um, but I think we've worked really hard with uh, school groups, with the uh, Massachusetts Interscholastic Athletic Association, as well as others, to try to allay those fears, but especially to make people understand or make sure that people understand what the regulations actually do. We've had um, several calls before, you know, at the end of the summer, you know, as school was starting so that people could call in, ask questions, because does this work, does this, you know, would this comply? Uh, and what I found, uh, and I'm not surprised at all, is that the coaches, the athletic directors, they want to do what's good and what's right for the kids. And what's the ultimate goal of the legislation? The ultimate goal is to keep students safe. What we know is that if you have a concussion and you go back to sports before uh, you're fully healed and you have the athletic uh, activity associated with that and if you have another injury you're much more likely to have a severe injury the next time or even a catastrophic one that could be fatal. So the idea really is to make sure that kids have enough time to heal um, so that they're not in the position of having one of those really terrible outcomes. Well, I think the most important thing that coaches in schools can do is to have a concussion management plan in place at all levels. And most importantly for the coach, the athletic director, um, is that if they don't have a certified athletic trainer as part of their staff, if they don't have employed uh, team physicians as part of their staff, um, that anybody suspected of having a concussion needs to be pulled out of play, pulled out of game, play and or practice and cleared only by somebody with that proper expertise. Um, for a coach to suspect a concussion, he's going to have to have concussion education himself. And the same goes for the player and the same goes for the parent. Are there consequences for schools that don't comply? The law gave us the authority to impose penalties or consequences. We have at this point chosen not to take the uh, the penalty approach because as I said we really are finding that people want to do the right thing with uh, with this so we're really providing technical assistance uh, we're developing model guidelines and policies so that schools can have those to use um, really we've been asking um, developing frequently asked questions because people had a lot of uh, questions that they want to know we put that online so our focus really has been supporting schools to do it um, theoretically, we could develop penalties, but that's not been how we've approached it so far. While the law is a very important step in addressing the concussion problem, everyone working on this issue agrees that more education is also critical. Education is the easiest thing in the world to accomplish. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't take a great deal. Um, but the hardest thing, I think, because, you know, Dr. Cantu and Chris Nowinski have put together the most phenomenal concussion clinic that, I, I mean, I can't imagine a better one. And in fact, the feedback from coaches who do attend, is that they say this was the most worthwhile training I've ever been to. And I would encourage other players, you know, and coaches to come when you come back. The, the discouraging thing is there's 35 people in the room. People don't recognize their need for the information. And I understand that because I, you know, three years ago, I say this all the time, three years ago, if you had said, please come out, there's an education, you know, there's a concussion clinic, I wouldn't have gone out. I mean, the evenings are hectic. I've got three kids. I'm putting dinner on the table. We've got homework. I wouldn't have gone because I didn't know what I didn't know. And, um, you know, now that I, you know, and I'd say uh, now that I know what I know, all I, I wish once people are exposed to it, they realize and they say, now I would get everybody I know here. Um, the challenge is to get people to understand how important this information is and how big the gap is between their knowledge level and what they fully need to understand to do a better job of, of, uh, of, uh, of protecting their child. 
the Sports Legacy Institute has programs that they're implementing to do this education. Uh, we want to get the word out there that, that, that these programs are available. I think parents need to become more aware and need to educate themselves. Um, I, I think that they probably have over the years been relying on coaches and trainers um, for this kind of information and, and in many cases those coaches and trainers don't even have it. So parents need to take that on themselves and really understand what's going on. And then we need to do a better job of educating coaches and trainers, making sure that they get special training on this, that they, they're aware, that they know what to do, they know where to turn to. Um, it's, we, we haven't put any criteria in place or any specific requirements for somebody to be a coach or a trainer um, in the, in the, for the smaller kids. And, um, and we need to have some, some better programs for them. I think it's just very important that parents really understand the impact of their child's concussion. I've seen a number of families in my office that although their child is their number one priority, the bigger picture is they want the scholarship, they want the child to do the best, they want the child to be that trophy child. And I think that parents need to understand that whenever there's an issue, um, no matter how small it is, that the parents, if, if there's two parents, to come together on the benefit of that child to say, we need to stand our, our ground and say absolutely no return to play until we're comfortable that he or she has returned to somewhat normal baseline. And I don't see that enough out there. I see parents arguing with one another. I see, um, I see a lot of dads saying it's okay for him to return. I know it's okay to return. I would have returned if this were me. And I think that the kids who are coming out now are more apt to say, wait a minute, because of the concussion laws and what we're teaching. So if I can impress upon anything, it's to know your child and, and it's to really be aware. And if they need to be pulled, it's okay to be pulled. Where the parents have to divulge if the child has had a concussion before. Is there a lot of information available for the parents? Because a lot of people don't realize that a simple headache can be a result of a concussion. Right. Well, that's an excellent point, and that's why we're pairing um, that with the training piece. So ideally, people have been trained to understand what can, a concussion can really look like. But the way the questions are asked are really, you know, has the child ever had a head injury? Um, have they ever had these kind of symptoms? And if so, you know, when did that happen and how long did it last? So we're, we're trying to, to get at that uh, until everyone re you know, really understands what a concussion is. But we feel like that's important information uh, for the coaches and the athletic staff to have so they know uh, who they need to look out for. Can't the trainer or coach overrule the parent? They can overrule the parent to a degree, but when you're talking about children, you can team shop. Um, you know, this can follow you. If you're in a more structured um, sport, absolutely, then the trainer can follow. But there are parents who will team shop until they get the answer that they want, and they'll pull their child from a school. So you think not just coaches and trainers, but maybe all pediatricians should be trained in concussion awareness? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's critical. We're going to see more and more. And with the concussion law, these children will have to have a go-to to return to sports. So somebody's going to have to answer these questions. There's a lot that parents should do, and most of it they're not doing. And, you know, one of our goals is to really turn parents into advocates for their own kids. You know, they're advocates for them in so many things, but they really don't be, pay attention when it comes to sports and the environment that coaches create. Now we know, you know, and I'm a firm believer that coaches are out there because they care about the kids, they want them to succeed, but they also don't like people telling them what to do, they don't like restrictions, and because they're mostly volunteers, they don't have the time to invest to learn this information. So um, what parents should be paying attention to is, you know, it, it's a long list. Are their coaches educated on concussions? At a minimum, are they doing the CDC's online certification, which is 30 minutes and free? If they're not, you shouldn't be sending your kid there because there's no reason they shouldn't be doing that. You know, there are l larger ways to, uh, to, uh, to teach and to educate. And, you know, we provide a lot of that through Sports Legacy Institute, but at a minimum, the free online stuff. Is there a preseason meeting for the athletes and the parents so that they understand what's going on? especially now. Maybe we won't need it in 10 years because everyone will get it by then, but now no one gets it. We're always walking into cold rooms where no one, you know, I, 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 I gave a talk to 500 coaches in Chicago and I said, okay, how many coaches here have had first aid training? Everyone's hand went up. How many coaches here have had CPR training? Everyone's hand went up. How many coaches here have had concussion training at any point in their career? Three hands went up out of 500. Like, let's, let's, let's wake up here. So, starts with education. That needs to happen. 
um, then you know you have to look at your your program's policies. Does you know all the guidelines now say and it's now state laws in over 30 states, no return to play, same day of a suspected concussion, required medical clearance to go back. Does your league require that? Most laws don't actually touch the, low, the youngest kids. So if you have a seven-year-old seven -year out there playing a collision sport, you better be sure they have those policies in place and they're educated enough to use them. Does the program commit to redu a reduction of repetitive brain trauma? Because we're realizing now the concussions aren't the only problem. Every hit to the head may be damaging. And what we're certain of is every hit after a concussion is really damaging. And if we're only diagnosing 10% of concussions, we should not be opening the door to 90% of those kids taking another 100 hits to the head every week. Uh, and so, um, you know, are the coaches hitting a lot in practice? Are your soccer coaches paying attention at all to how many times kids are heading the ball in practice? You know, we have pitch counts in youth baseball to protect athletes' elbows. And we never ask a soccer coach or a football coach to even consider counting how often they hit your child in the head. So that should be a, co a question parents ask. They should be looking at the equipment. Are they using newer helmets? Have they been reconditioned? That's, that's part of it. It's, it's lower down the list, but that's still part of it. Um, and you know, there's, there's, there's more, but I, think, I would say at a minimum, if, 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 minimum if, if your coaches have not been certified and educated by the CDC, don't sign up your kids because you know, they could end up being one of those kids in our brain bank just out of ignorance. Are there any other requirements of the regulation? Uh, there are a few that I think it would be important for people to know about. To begin with, parents have to uh, submit information at the beginning of the season saying whether or not their child has ever had a head injury before, uh, a concussion. And that's really important so that the certified athletic trainer, the coach, the school nurse can really know if this child is at risk. Once you've had a concussion, you're at higher risk of having a second concussion. And for some of our students who've had multiple concussions, it really does bring up the issue whether or not they should play a different position or, or something else has to be modified to lower the risk of them having a, a subsequent concussion. So that's an important piece to start mm -hmm. communication. Um, the other piece is that if there's an injury that happens during a game or a practice, coaches have to notify the parents and they have to do that directly. They can't just you know, give the information to the student and say, you know, tell your parents what happened. So, and many schools are already doing that, so that's another important piece. Um, I guess the, the next piece really is that once a child or a student has been pulled from practice or a game because there's a suspected concussion, they need to go back, be evaluated, and have a full medical clearance before they can come back. The idea behind that really is to make sure, again, that um, they're able to do what they need to do when they come back. And they can't start playing, they can't start their sports until they're completely clear of symptoms and they've gone through what's called a graduated return to play. That's where you start off really kind of slow, you do a, a little bit of light activity and then you move it up. Because many times uh, patients or athletes will experience symptoms at some of these lower levels and then they have to go back and wait until those symptoms resolve. Um, so that's a really important that people are going to have to get used to. The kids have to go through this gradual return to, to play. You know, and just the other piece that hasn't been done before that I think is a really important part of what we're doing is that there also needs to be um, accommodations for the student at school. If students have symptoms that really persist for a while, then schools need to sort of help them and figure out a plan for making sure they get back into the academics in the same way that they need a plan for getting back into sports. We are taking it more seriously now. I think that over the years, and, and as you, I'm sure, can recall many years ago, there were those that just shrugged it off. You hear a lot of people continue to say, shrug it off, but I think with more publicity and people coming forward that we are taking more precautions on looking at this seriously. What kind of resources are there for families who might be looking for more information on concussions or want to treat concussions? We have a few resources. We have had very limited resources um, on a national level, but I think here in Massachusetts we've got a few. Um, Spalding Rehabilitation Network, um, which is all over the state, does provide outpatient rehab centers for brain injury, for concussion rehab. Um, the Brain Injury Association of Massachusetts is one. Um, it's a state organization. There's one in every state on a national level. 
can call up and ask for resources um, surrounding concussions, support groups, and physicians, um, as well as myself, um, concussion rehab specialist um, in Salem, Massachusetts. Happy to provide as many resources as needed, or at least to be a go-to person for those that aren't familiar with resources for the state. Concussionrehab.com. Groups like the Alzheimer's Association are probably are probably providing support, um, but that's probably because a lot of these guys are being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and it's not really Alzheimer's disease. And the Alzheimer's Association has great programs for them because those kinds of programs can help support the families for this illness too. Um, but there, there needs to be something that's probably a little bit more specific and a little bit more specialized because it's a little bit different to have a great big guy who's 250 pounds who's having these problems and who's still physically probably still pretty healthy as opposed to an elderly 85 year old person who's probably smaller and frailer and, and has different issues going on. So we do need some more specialized programs for these guys. They're younger, they're stronger, they're bigger, um, and they have some, some special problems that, that, need, that the families need support on. Massachusetts new concussion law for schools promotes safety and well-being of all our athletes. Students must submit a history of head injuries to the school nurse before every season. Parents, players, coaches, school nurses, volunteers, trainers, and others associated with teams must participate in concussion training program every year. Any student who has suffered a head injury or suspected concussion during practice or competition must sit out the rest of the day and be cleared by a medical doctor before returning to play. Any head injury suffered during the season outside of team activity must be reported to the coach or specified school official. Any student diagnosed with a concussion must have a plan for gradually resuming athletic and academic activities. Schools must report annual concussion statistics to the state. My biggest concern, I think, is that I went for years um, not understanding exactly what was wrong with my husband. Um, and then when he was diagnosed for years caring for him at home, um, before I finally couldn't care for him anymore and he went into an assisted living facility. And I think that there are a lot of other families like that that are in the same situation. Um, they're not educated about what's going on and so they, they need for someone to actually reach out to them, find them, provide some help and support to even help them understand that this is actually an illness and a disease. And I don't think the NFL is, is taking that kind of action. I think they're kind of shying away from taking that step, but I think it's one that they really need to take. There are, there are families out there and former players out there that are suffering and they don't even know what they have. They don't even know what's going on. A, a parent of a young child from day one, I would want to be out in front and making sure that my child gets the best equipment, the best training, and the best education. And I think that's what happens sometimes. It's people just put a child on a field and throw them a ball and say, go for it. And no one is um, aware of the pitfalls. And here we are today, we do know what can happen. So let's just go forward and look to the future to be preventative. You know, right now I'm in a stage of where I'm just trying to deal with um, my husband's illness. It's too late for us. But if we can just all be preventative and take that and go with it in the future, you know, it'll be a better uh, sports community for all of us. Um, you know, maybe a few times when you, I was a kid did I ever maybe hit my head, but I don't remember ever having the symptoms of a concussion But uh, until I played football. Um, football was, you know, the sport that I got involved in that uh, brought me to concussions. <laughs> Part of the problem is that players may hesitate to report symptoms. They may believe their injuries are no big deal or they'll try to tough it out and return to the game for their team. There may be pressure from parents, other adults, or other players to keep playing. Don't let your athlete convince you that they're just fine or that they can tough it out. Emphasize to athletes and parents that playing with a concussion is dangerous. If a coach suspects a concussion in a young football player, it is critical that that player not return to play or practice. If one of your players has a concussion, their brain needs time to heal. A repeat concussion, one that occurs in a short time period before the brain recovers from the first, can be very dangerous as it may slow recovery or increase the chances of long-term problems. It can even be fatal. Most people who suffer a concussion fully recover. 
However, returning to sports and other regular activities too quickly can add weeks or months to an individual's recovery time. For boys and girls who are in school, concussions not only affect sports performance, they can affect school performance as well. Students may find they can't do their homework, they can't concentrate or study because it prolongs their symptoms, just like a premature return to sports. Exercising or activities that involve concentration, such as studying, working on the computer, and playing video games may cause concussion symptoms, such as headache or tiredness to reappear or get worse. After a concussion, physical and cognitive activities such as studying and learning should be carefully managed and monitored by a healthcare professional. Early on in my career, like my rookie year, I started to get uh, bouts of vertigo that I didn't understand why I was getting it. Um, you know, it, it would prolong itself for you know, periods of time where I'd just just be completely incapacitated and the coaches would just put me in a dark room and say take a nap and we'll see you after practice. Um, so knowing now I know that I probably was having residual effects and after having seen doctors know that those um, uh, migraine headaches that I was experiencing were probably triggering those episodes of vertigo. The good thing is is usually a concussion isn't as bad as a second concussion you know, if you get a, a concussion and a couple days later you hit it again, that's bad. So with all the new rules, when somebody is even thought that they may be concussed, that, and, and we had a player uh, go down and hit her head the other night in Acton Boxborough, and, you know, the trainer come over and spent, I'm going to say a half an hour with her evaluating her and her awareness and her, whether she was confused and, and, um, and it, everybody's taking it so serious that you can get over that first concussion in a couple of weeks. But if you get the second one, that's the one that'll linger on. And the kid that got hurt last year, we found out she had hit her head previously in another game for another league before it happened. So second hit is, uh, is devastating. We are very supportive of students engaging in sports. Being an athlete, doing sports is absolutely um, a key part of being a, a healthy adult and getting those uh, developing those habits is important. Uh, so we want to be supportive of sports. Initially there was some concern that, oh my gosh, you're trying to you know, get rid of sports. And that's not the case at all. We just want to make sure that students are safe in doing it. Uh, I have three kids. They all play sports every season. So I understand the, the importance of sports uh, in kids' lives. And so we just want to make sure that kids are able to do that in a healthy way. We got two concussions out of the game, I think three years ago in Andover. We had a concussion last year and we lost a girl for half of the year, a very important player, a center on one of our lines, uh, had a concussion, was gone for half the season. So yeah, it's always there. There's a lot of contact out there. You know, they, they can, you can make contact with somebody as long as you don't lower a shoulder, as long as you don't extend a hip, or you don't extend. So if you bump into somebody, it's incidental contact. And there's a lot of incidental contact and it's very, very rough. But as long as you don't extend on the hit, it's not considered a check. So it's not like they're playing a game without contact. It's, you know, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of mucking it up, especially in the corners. I'd like to thank all the guests for sharing their stories with us. While it may be too late for them to undo some of the damage, it is not too late to prevent the rest of us and our children from some of these injuries. Take a moment to review the symptoms again, and if you or your child are experiencing any of these, do not return to activities until being cleared by a trained professional. Massachusetts School of Law, I'm Holly Vitsky and this is Educational Forum.